Hello and welcome to College Physics 2, Lecture 3, Coulomb's Law. In this lecture, we're going to take what we've learned in the first two lectures and quantify it, meaning we're going to build an equation that we can use to solve actual problems now. Well, that equation, and the title of this lecture, is Coulomb's Law. This equation states the following. If two charged particles that have charges, say, Q1 and Q2, are some distance r apart. The particles will experience equal and opposite forces on each other of magnitude f given by the following. k, q1, q2, both of those absolute valued, divided by r squared. Now a few notes. k is a constant. This is known as the electrostatic constant. And the value for k is given below. 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Now, it's totally fine for purposes in my course to just use 9 times 10 to the 9. Much easier to remember and uh, to write. So, for just basic calculation purposes, it's totally fine to use 9 times 10 to the 9. In fact, I use that myself uh, when I go through uh, examples in class. Q's the, the charges, Q, are absolute va valued because we're just talking about the magnitude of the force. Remember, magnitude just means size, or how big, or how strong the force is. That doesn't care about what the direction is. There's no vector arrow above the F to indicate a direction. So we're just talking about the size, so we're always going to be using positive values here. You'll see in an example soon where the negatives come into play. Now this equation should make sense. The Q's are up top in the equation because the more charge you have, the stronger the push or pull is going to be. So more charge means more force. The distance between them being down below also should make sense to us as we learned in our first lecture. The closer the two charges are to one another, the stronger the force. But the further away they are, the weaker the force. That's indicating some inverse relationship. So if you increase your distance r down here, you're dividing by more, which means you're weakening the force. And that's exactly what we saw in our demonstrations. So the images on the right just show you some examples of this. So here you have the two charges both being positive, some distance r apart. They're exerting forces on one another. The charge q1 is exerting a force on q2, so we call that 1 on 2. And the charge Q2 is exerting a force back on 1, F2 on 1. They're both positive, like charges, so they're going to repel one another. And the same is true of negative charges. They're also like charges, they will repel. But this equation still holds true even in the case of opposite charges, the difference here being they attract one another. But this equation still applies, and we still see equal and opposite forces. Now, typically, there's multiple charges involved. So it might not just be as simple as you know, solving for one value of f and then you're done. So you might have to do that multiple times and find the total or what we call net force on something. So anytime you have to calculate the net force of multiple charges acting on a single charge, you'll have to simply do a vector sum, meaning add those values up, but keeping in mind their directions, because they are vectors. As we have saw throughout Physics 1, force is a vector. So the equation for this, let's say you have you know, uh, multiple charges, one through however many, in this case we say three, and we want to figure out how much force those three charges are exerting on some random charge j altogether. In other words, that net charge. So the equation down here simply shows the fact that you do a vector sum add up each individual uh, force value, and get the total. So, that's the lecture. Let's work on examples and then some questions. To start, we are going to work on a more basic uh, one-dimensional problem here to get us started, and then we're going to expand into a two-dimensional problem on the following slide. So, in this problem, it says two positive 10 nanocoulomb charged particles are two centimeters apart on the x-axis. 
What is the net force on a 10 nanocoulomb charge midway between them? There's a second part to this, we'll cover that in a minute. So, in terms of a visual representation of this, we're only focusing right now on A, B is for later. So, they're along the x-axis, we've got two charges, Q1 and Q2, and then we're placing a third charge right in the middle of them. Everything's positive in this example, right? We have two positive charges and then a third positive charge. They're all positive. So Q1 is going to repel Q3 off to the right, right? That's F1 on 3, right? It's like charges repel, so Q1 is going to try to push it to the right. However, Q2 is also positive, so it's going to try to push back on charge 3. That is the force F2 on 3. So we're going to see a force in both directions. Now I purposely chose this example to do first because we already, based on this visualization, should know what our answer is. In fact, it's technically written on the picture. These are the same value of charge. They're the same distance away from the middle charge. And so we should see that they're equal and opposite. So if we were to solve this with math, we should get an answer of zero. But you know how this works if you've been through my videos before. We need to show work. Now, if you're in my class, I would probably accept a writing, in writing, an answer if you can explain exactly why it would be zero. Um, but the standard practice is you should just show the work. So let's go ahead and try to solve this problem here together. Uh, so in this case, we're going to start by recognizing that we have multiple forces. So we're going to have to solve for a net force. So let's start there. We have a net force we're trying to solve, F net. It is a vector, technically, so we want to include this. Well, there's two forces acting on charge 3, so we have to write down two values here. We have the force F uh, 1 on 3. Uh, and by the way, if my handwriting gets bad, I am very sorry. I do my best with these, but... You know, I thought after years of teaching it'd get better, but I was uh, sadly mistaken. Uh, so we have uh, our force 1 on 3, but then we also have to include our force 2 on 3, because they're both acting on that charge. So this is what our equation looks like in its most basic form. So they are, thankfully in this example, both lying along the same dimension, the x-axis. So we don't have to worry about any trig here to help us figure out components of the vectors. We do just get to do a straightforward addition. The one thing we do have to worry about, though, is the direction, the sign. F1 on 3 points to the right, meaning it is positive. So I'm going to put that in here, even though it's not necessary. The equation is kqq over r squared, so we have k, charge q1, charge q3, and then all of this divided by the distance, uh, which I'm going to call r13. Uh, it's not r13, it's just r charge 1 and charge 3, that's the way I'm denoting it. Now we have to add the second force, but be careful because f2 on 3 is pointing to the left. So this is going to be negative. Same equation, just different subscripts. So k, in this case we're looking at charge q2, then q3, all this divided by the distance, which I'll call r23 squared. So this is the setup for our equation. At this point, even though there's quite a few of them, all we have to do is plug in our numbers. k is the constant that we just introduced, and one that you're going to use frequently, that is 9 times 10 to the 9. And that's Newton meters squared per coulomb squared. Honestly, the units are the only maybe challenging part of memorizing that number. Uh, then we have our two charges. So they're all 10 nanocoulombs. So, um, oh, oh, I am sorry. Uh, I forgot to mention, I forgot to put a decimal here. This is 1 nanocoulomb. So we have the 10 nanocoulomb charge. So 10, and nano means times 10 to the minus 9. So we have a 10 times 10 to the minus 9 charge, and then a 1 nanocoulomb charge. So 1 times 10 
to the minus 9. All this divided by the distance between them, uh, which if the total distance is 2 centimeters between these two big charges, that's a very bad parenthesis, but uh, this is 2 centimeters. So dividing that in half, we have 1 centimeter on each side. So this is just going to be 1 centimeter, which is 0 0.01 meters, quantity squared. Well, that was only one of the two, so we still have to worry about the other one. So we have our minus sign here. K again, so 9 times 10 to the minus 9. Uh, I'm sorry, 9 times 10 to the 9. Newton meter squared per coulomb squared. And there goes my handwriting, sorry. And then we have the same charges again. So uh, 10 nanocoulombs, so 10 times 10 to the minus 9. And 1 nanocoulomb. All right, and again, we're dividing by the distance between the charges, which is also in this case 0 0.01 meters squared. Well, we said our answer is supposed to be zero, and looking at these equations, we have nine times 10 times one. Over here, we have nine times 10 times one, all raised to the same powers, divided by 0 0.01, divided by 0 0.01. So, it's all the same. One's positive, one's negative. You could type this in, but you'll see that it comes out to be, as we expected, zero newtons of force. They're both equally pulling on that central charge. Now, let's say this is part B. It says, what is the net force of the charged particle on the right is now negative. So let's pretend at this point, we now have a negative charge over here. Right, so we are indicating this with a blue minus sign over here. So we have a slight adjustment. The good news is that the values are all still the same. However, there's going to be one key difference, and that is the difference in our signs. Notice now that both of our forces are pointing to the right. Positive charge Q1 repels the charge to the right, but negative charge Q2 attracts it to the right. Both of these become positive as a result. So if we wanted to solve, like, say, part B, I'm going to just shorthand this a little bit. You, could, you should probably show all work. I'm just going to shorthand it. Uh, so let's say our F net is going to equal, um, let's see, we have our, um, let's see, we'll, we'll put it as, I mean, F1 on 3 plus F2 on 3, just like above. But here they are both positive. So I'm actually running out of space as well. So for the sake of time and space, I'm going to say it's equal to the same as above, so the same numbers as above. And if you calculate this out, you will get 1.8 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so uh, I, I probably sh um, I'm setting a bad example by not showing the work uh, because I do expect students to show it, but it's just for the sake of time in our lecture. All of the numbers you see up here are the same as down here. So we're just taking the same numbers as above. The only difference is they're both positive this time, and there we see our new answer. Okay, so this is a good example of a one-dimensional problem. Now we get to see a good example of a two-dimensional problem. Now, here things are going to get a little interesting uh, because this is a very long problem. And I can guarantee my students that you will see uh, a problem like this again. Uh, I give the problem similar to this in a homework, sometimes on tests. So it is considered to be an important problem to work on. I do encourage you to pay attention as best you can throughout this process. So, in this case, we are now dealing with three charges again, but the difference is it's two-dimensional, right? It's not just along an x-axis. So our goal is to figure out the net force on the third charge, which you can see labeled down here at the bottom. To start, let's try to visualize what's going to happen. Q2 is also positive, meaning it's going to repel charge Q3, right? Opposites attract, likes repel. So we're going to see a force 
pushing away on Q3. Something kind of like this. Let's call this F, uh, what is that, 2 on 3. Right? A like charge is repel, so it's going to push it down into the left. However, the other charge, Q1, is, uh, let's see, I'll use a darker blue, is negative, so that's going to attract our positive charge up and to the left. So this is going to be F1 on 3. So what sets up here is something pretty interesting because we have a charge being pulled up into the left and down into the left. So we can kind of form these little triangles to help us visualize this a little bit better. Um, you know, we have X and Y that we'll have to deal with. So we also have an angle on each of these. And thankfully for this example, we made it simple. We aren't given an angle, but we know we're going to have to figure out what that angle is so we can plug it into our equations. Well, to start, let's just look at this diagram. We have 5 centimeters away and 5 centimeters away vertically. So the two sides of this triangle are both 5 centimeters, which means this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. If you don't know what I mean, you can solve it, but theta is going to be 45 degrees. To prove this, if you want, we can go through and show this. We are used to doing this because what we would want to do is use inverse tangent to figure this out. So tan minus 1 of your y value over your x value. In this case, that would be inverse tangent. Uh, we don't have to worry about units because they're one divided by the other, so it's 5 over 5. Inverse tangent of 1 is 45 degrees. So uh, in this case, we know our angle, but we still don't know one more thing. And that would be the distance these charges are away from one another. Notice that we don't know, technically yet, what this distance is. And let's call this the distance R. They are the same on both sides, so we need to figure out what that distance would be before we can really even start this problem. So I would start there. Let's go ahead and figure out what the value R is. And I'll do this over here. We know two sides of a triangle. We want to know the third side. So you would do this as the square root of uh, 5 centimeters squared plus the other side, 5 centimeters squared. This is going to give you, uh, this. by the way, this is Pythagorean theorem. So this is going to give you 7.07 .07 centimeters, which is 0 0.0707 meters. So we now know what the distance R is between our charges. At this point, we're actually ready to start working out this problem. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have enough space on this slide, so I may have to do some erasing to uh, replenish space. Uh, so let's go ahead and see what happens. Well, we, we take the same process as in example one. We need to find the net force. In other words, that would be the net force. Uh, I guess I'll write this over here. So uh, we need to figure out the net force, which would be the vector sum of F1 on 3 and the vector sum of 2 on 3. But it is not as simple as it was in the last example. Previously, we just calculated these, and then we were able to solve. But this time, the arrows are pointing in two dimensions. So we cannot simply just add those two arrows together, or those two vector values together. So we have a lot of work to do. To start, let's find each of these two force values and go from there. So we're going to look for F1 on 3. F1 on 3 is going to be uh, the same as F2 on 3 in this example. So I'm going to save a little space here by showing both. Because they are the same charge, 50 nanocoulombs, and they are the same distance away, we know that these two values will be the same. So let's go ahead and calculate it. We know that the equation is kqq over r squared. In this case, I'm not putting subscripts just because 
It could be the same for force 1 or force 2 on 3. Uh, this is r squared. I'm going to erase that just so we don't get confused later. That is an r. So uh, in this case, we can go ahead and plug in our numbers to solve this. We have k, which is our constant, 9 times 10 to the 9. 9 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared times the two charges. So we have one being 50 nanocoulombs, the other being 30 nanocoulombs. 50 nano, again, nano means times 10 to the minus 9, and 30 times 10 to the minus 9. And charge being measured in coulombs. All of this gets divided by the distance that we just solved for, r, that is 0 0.070. and that quantity gets squared. So calculating this out, we will see a value of about 2.7 times 10 to the minus three newtons. Okay, well, this is a good start. Uh, we have both of these force values, but again, we can't just directly add these. We can't just say, oh, it's 2.7 times 10 to the minus three plus 2.7 times 10 to the minus three because they point in different directions. So if you take my physics one class, you know what's coming. But the idea here is we need to split this up. We need to figure out the X and the Y components of each of these two vectors. Because once we do that, we can add the two X values together since they'd both be lying horizontally. And we could then add the two Y values together because those would both be vertical. So that's our goal. We have to find one on three X, one on three Y, 2 on 3x and 2 on 3y. So we got to solve for four different values here. So let's start with 1 on 3x. Well, first, let's write the equation. Notice which direction it's pointing in the x direction. f1 and 3 is pointing leftward. So this is going to be a negative value, f1 on 3. And we're looking for the x component. That is adjacent, that is the adjacent side of the triangle, it's the one next to your angle, compared to the hypotenuse. Think of your trig functions and SOHCAHTOA. Uh, we have the adjacent hypotenuse side, so that will be our cosine trig function. So, uh, in this case, we have negative uh, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons times cosine of 45 degrees. This gives a value of negative 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3. All right, so that's one of our four values. Let's stick with 1 on 3, but do the y value. Now, 1 on 3, which is our blue arrow here, is pointing leftward and upward. Up is the positive y direction, so that one stays positive. And now we're talking about the opposite side of the triangle compared to the hypotenuse. That is our sine function. And again, if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, this is SOHCAHTOA. So this is just telling you if you have sine, that's opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite adjacent. All right, so plug in your values again, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 3 and times sine of 45 degrees. Here, it's all the same numbers. The only difference is it's positive, so we get 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. OK, uh, if you're on mobile, some of this writing could be a bit small. Uh, so just be aware that this is best viewed on a desktop if you can, or a laptop. Now we move on to f2 on 3. We'll start with x. Well, 2 on 3 is our red arrow that's pointing leftward and downward. Leftward means it's negative in the x direction. And it's the x direction here that is, again, the adjacent side of the triangle. So we're going to be using cosine theta. Very similar setup here. Uh, it's negative, so we have negative 2.7 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons times cosine of 45. 
And same values as above, here we get negative 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3. This brings us to our final of these four values, f2 on 3y. So it is pointing downward, so that's also a negative value. And we're talking about the opposite or um, uh, we're talking about the opposite y direction, so this is going to be our sine trig function. So this feels redundant, but um, I like to use our first example with numbers that just kind of make sense. If these are all random numbers, it'd be a little bit harder to visualize what's happening in this problem. So I try to keep it simple with similar numbers. The only downside, again, is feeling the pain of writing the same numbers over and over again. But what we now have is the x and a y value for the first vector and an x and a y for the second one. We are now able to add up the forces in the x direction and then the forces in the y direction. So uh, this is kind of a little separate step. So now we're going to look for the net force in the x direction, which would be the sum of the two forces in the x direction, f1 on 3x and f2 on 3x. So we add these two values up. f1 on 3x, which we saw as the first value, was a negative 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3, plus f2 on 3x, which is down here, that is negative 1.9 again. So negative 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3. We have negative 1.9 minus 1.9, that gives us a overall value of negative 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3. Now we do the same for the y direction. Find the total value change in the y direction, which would be f1 on 3y plus f2 on 3y. In this case, uh, we look at our y values. The first one's positive, 1 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3, plus the next one, which is negative again, negative 1 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3. Ah, well here, one's positive, one's negative, this becomes a lovely zero newtons. In physics, zeros are our friend. They save us quite a bit of work, although we've done plenty already. So if you're just kind of tuning back in, this looks crazy already. There's so much on the screen. But all we did was find how big each of these arrows were and then figured out how big they were in both directions, x and y, and then added those up. It looks like I'll be able to fit this all on the screen, so I'll just use an arrow here to indicate where I'm going with this. We are almost done, even though there's so much being done in this problem. There's really just kind of one step left. We now know the overall force pointing to the left, and the overall force vertically. So, if we want to know the overall value now, we use Pythagorean Theorem. F net, what we're looking for, would be the square root of each individual one squared. So F net x squared plus F net y. Quantity squared. Now, this might seem unnecessary, because one of these values is zero, but we like to show work to make sure things make sense. So uh, f net x was a negative 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3. One quick thing to note here, this does get squared. Some students tend to put the minus sign on the outside of their parentheses, or they don't use parentheses at all. Your calculator will not pick that up. It'll do a negative and then this value squared, keeping it overall a negative value. And then you try to take the square root of a negative value, it doesn't work. Be careful, uh, the negative gets squared too. Uh, a negative times a negative is positive. So uh, make sure you keep those parentheses there and with your minus sign on the inside. And then we have the zero newtons as well. All right, uh, so again, it seems unnecessary. So we score this number and then take the square root of it. So we get back 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3. And there you have it. You have the net force that acts on 
that third charge, 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3. In addition, we know its direction because one's up and to the left, one's down and to the left. They're equal sized, so this is going to be in the negative x direction. All right. Well, there is our solution. So again, you will see more like these uh, if you're in my course. Um, I understand trig is hard for students to work with and, you know, drawing these pictures, visualizing everything, you know, it can be challenging. Uh, so please be careful. If you have questions, let me know. One thing to note is if it wasn't as simple as just being symmetric and pointing straight to the left, we would have to figure out our angle. And we do that again by something similar as to up here. Uh, you would want to do your inverse tangent of your y value divided by your x value down here to solve for theta. So just be careful. Uh, if it's not symmetric like this, you would have to solve for theta using your inverse tangent like we've seen in the past. All right, let's conclude this lecture with a few end of lecture questions. Which vector below shows the force one on two if the distance between the spheres is reduced by half? So we're going to take this setup over here and just cut the distance in half. What would the force uh, arrow look like here if this is the one that it had originally? All right, so keep in mind the equation is kqq over r squared. And that's the key part here is the r squared. What we're doing is cutting the distance in half. So really what we're doing is taking this equation as it is and cutting that distance in half. So we have r over 2 here. Well, this is the same as saying, you know, you have got the values up top. Then we have basically 1 half squared here. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. But then that's 1 over 1 fourth, which becomes 4. So what we're saying is the value that we should get is four times larger than what we had initially. Well, this, this arrow here is pretty large as it is. That's the same size as B. C is only twice as big. What we need is an arrow that is four times as big. So, I mean, we're talking something like this. So none of the above is the correct answer. We need a large arrow uh, that shows the force being four times as large to be correct. Question two, which of the three right-hand charges experiences the largest force? Okay, well again, keep in mind our equation that we need to use, kqq over r squared. So in this particular case, here we have those values. So we have k, capital Q, lowercase q, and then we have our r squared. This is kind of the one we're going to base our discussion on. Well, down here, we have the same setup, F, regular Q. But here we have uh, 2 times the charge, so times 2Q. But then it also gets divided by 2R. But that quantity gets squared. So what we're seeing here is a factor of 2 up top, but a factor of 2 squared or 4 on the bottom, right, 2 squared is 4. So this is the same as saying the force is going to be changed by 1 half. So it's actually going to be a weaker force in this example. All right, let's move on to the last one. We have our equation, K times capital Q, this time times 4Q, all divided by 2 times the distance, quantity squared. Well, here we have a factor of 4 up top, and a factor of 2 squared, or 4 on the bottom. 4 divided by 4 is just 1, so we're changing this by a factor of 1. In other words, it is not changing at all compared to what we had above. So we have kqq over r squared up here, and here we have kqq over r squared as well once you cancel out the 4s. So it turns out that our answer for this problem is actually e. The first and the third ones are correct. They are tied as the larger of the three forces. 
All right. I believe we have a few more. So here we see a series of charges. We have uh, three positive charges listed and then a fourth with a bunch of arrows pointing off of it. We want to know which direction the net force would be on that lower left charge. In other words, which of these four arrows shows you the correct direction? All right. Well, in this case, the answer is B. So B is the correct answer here. So charge, we'll call this one, two, and three. Charge one is gonna repel the positive downward. Charge three is gonna repel the charge to the left. Combining those two, something pushing down into the left is an arrow like B, down into the left. But then we also have this influence here, which pushes straight along B. So all three of these together combine to give you a force in this direction toward B. So that is our answer. They're all positive, so they're all repelling. But here's a different one. Now, same question, what is the direction of the net force, but this time on the charge up top? Okay. Well, first, notice that we have a negative charge down here. Opposites attract. So this is going to be pulled down into the right by charge minus Q. However, there's also a positive charge over here, the same distance away, that's going to be trying to push it away up into the right. So uh, let's see, red and blue makes purple, I guess. Uh, so if you combine these two up into the right and down into the right, the overall answer would be to the right. So our answer is D in this example. One more. The direction of the force on minus Q is the following, or is what? All right. Well, the negative charge here is going to repel the other negative charge. So we'll, ha we'll have some blue arrow, maybe a little hard to see on the color background, but we've got our blue arrow pushing it away. But there's a positive charge present as well. That's going to attract the negative charge toward it. However, that one is further away. And we learned that the further away the charges are, the weaker the force is. So I drew a smaller arrow on purpose. Overall, we have a big blue arrow, a small red arrow. The blue one wins out so that the overall force is going to point to the right. The answer here is D. Okay, so hopefully that uh, helps you a little bit uh, in terms of figuring out some of the math behind all this and these questions help you visualize, visualize the, um, you know, what's happening behind all that math. So uh, this is just our introduction to Coulomb's Law. Again, it is one you will see frequently and in in a way, a sort of in free, or in a indirect way because other equations we're about to introduce look very similar to it. Uh, so we've got a lot going on in our future lectures. These are our three foundation lectures though. I hope this has been helpful to you. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.